Good morning. Good to see you online this morning. Uh, we'll see if folks filter in later. I, I don't know if the snow got them or what's going on, but it's good to see uh, folks online, I suppose. I, I guess there's folks online, but this is one of those we broadcast by faith sort of things. So good to see you this morning. At least my family's here. They have to be here, though. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for this day, and we just pray that you would work in hearts and lives and guide and direct, keep us safe. Thank you for being our God. And thank you for taking care of us. I pray you fill us with your spirit and empty us of ourselves. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll forego any songs today, I suppose. So, by way of announcements, we do have in person services and uh, the snow snow's all melted here, so I, I don't know what the back roads look like, but snow's all melted here, and we're pretty thankful for that. That's a limited amount of shoveling, and it's pretty to look at, so we thank the Lord for that and trust that wherever you are that you're safe. Uh, COVID cases are the lowest, uh, as the uh, announcement says on your screen there, COVID cases are the lowest they've been since October, November. That's why we're having in-person services. So we hope that each and every person that is under the sound of my voice will come because there's no reason not to. And we uh, trust that you will. So we hope that you'll be here and look forward to seeing you. And we'll have services 7 o'clock on Wednesday. Good morning. We'll have services at 7 o'clock on Wednesday as usual. And look forward to that. So you all don't need to wear your masks. There's no one else here. So that's fine. What's that? I'll wear my mask Okay. Whatever you want to do. Good morning. But we'll have service 7 o'clock Wednesday. The ladies' bathroom is fully functional, as I mentioned, and we're rolling right along with that. So feel free to use that. We've got the heaters going in there. Okay. Well, with those, any other things I missed, dear? All right. Well, Phoebe's going to play, and again, I did not write down the number. You have the number? Not at the moment. That's, I think it's 47 or something like that. Let me look it up real quick. It's what a friend we have in Jesus. 435. What a friend we have in Jesus. Phoebe's going to play that now for you. Okay, thank you, Phoebe. That was 435. What a friend we have in Jesus. Let's go ahead and we'll turn to Ephesians 5, I suppose. So, 
<sighs> Today's been one of those days, so please just pray that God would speak to your heart and I trust that he will. <sighs> Thankful for the blessings of the week and everything that God did bring our way, so... Please do pray for Matthew as he's at Pensacola. Pray for Heather with her torn ACL. And Daniel as he's down military. And my mother with her tests and whatnot. Appreciate that. All right. Ephesians 5, verse number 20 says, Giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, we thank you once more that we can meet today, and we pray that you would speak to our hearts through your word, that you would fill us with your spirit and help us. Thank you for all that you do for us. Thank you for Jesus who came and died for us and lives for us, is doing great work in heaven today, and just thank you for the manifold blessings we have. And we pray that you'd help us to overcome. And today, the world, flesh, and the devil's really working, and we just pray that you'd help us. That's all we can ask for. We'll thank you for what comes. We trust it will be for your glory. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're looking at Ephesians 5, good morning, and verse number 20, the topic, giving thanks always for all things, and it's been a little, little different today with the snow, but the snow is pretty, and thankfully the snow is melting. And, right, Jimmy? Yes, so we praise the Lord for that. So we're looking at the reasons why we should be thankful. And we trust that this has been a help to you. And first and foremost, we need to be thankful because we're God's children. And God has saved us. We're sinners saved by grace, as the Bible says. Not everyone, of course, is saved by grace, but we trust that everyone under the sound of my voice this morning is someone that's trusting Christ as their Savior and has acknowledged their sin nature and deservance of hell, repented of sin, and turned to Christ. And that's something we have to be thankful for, and all to be thankful for. And he made us to be his children. Also, we have God's word to live by, as we have covered, as it says, Ephesians 5, and verse number 1b, Therefore, followers of God, as dear children, and walk in love, as Christ also hath loved us, and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. How do we know how to follow Christ? We have God's word. And as Todd and I looked at Thursday, God's will and God's word never conflict, never, ever, ever. We have the only divine book in existence in God's word. Man is not creating more of them, even though they, he claims to be. But God has given us 66 books to live by, and that is all that we have, that's all we will ever have, and we ought to be thankful for it and can focus our lives on following it. And it's plenty of material to work at. Um, no one has ever fully followed God's word except for the Lord Jesus Christ. We're looking at the fact that we have God's spirit to assist us and we're considering in Galatians 5 that he helps us to bear spiritual fruit. And again, this has been a great help to me. I hope it's been a great help to you. As we consider the fruit of the flesh, we will consider the fruit of the Spirit eventually. But we have to know both to identify whether we are in the flesh or living in the Spirit. We have to consider these things because we live amongst a spiritual war, and we considered as we um, 
study the topic of hatred, our adversaries, which is the world, the flesh, and the devil, not people. We may not like what people do, but people are not our enemies. It's the world, the flesh, and the devil. And the devil is good at what he does. It's one of the things that we say around here. And he is, and the flesh, the flesh fights us all the time, which is much, which is why we must fight. And so verse number 16 of Galatians 5, if you recall, says this, I say then, walk in the spirit. You see, it's a choice. It's not something we accidentally fall into. It's a choice to be filled with the spirit. It's a choice to walk in the spirit and bear the fruit of the spirit. Walk in the spirit and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. There is no halfway walking in the flesh and halfway walking in the spirit. There is no 80-20. There is no 20-80. There is no 50-50. It is just one or the other. We're either spirit or walking in the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. Paul talked about this in Romans 7. But if you be led of the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the fruits of the flesh are manifest, which are these. And we're all the way up to hatred on this. We covered adultery and fornication thus far, uncleanness and lasciviousness. And again, uncleanness is that wicked, luxurious, wasteful living in flesh. You're so given to lasciviousness is this life lived out of control not having temperance about our lives. Then you have the idolatry and witchcraft, which we covered, idolatry, being following anything other than Christ. We can follow after our flesh, we can follow after people, we can follow after things, and hold them above Christ. Then we have witchcraft, the spiritism, the occultism that has so infiltrated our homes and society today that people see little to no problem with especially in churches and we must and we covered that we have to shun that and cast it out of our homes because it's not cute it is wicked and it opens doors that we should not into our homes and lives so we covered those and we're looking at hatred right now hatred and hatred as much as the other things adultery and fornication permeates our society does it not the wicked, luxurious living, these out lifestyles, this idolatry and witchcraft, all of this has permeated our society and so is hatred. So is hatred. We need to be careful with this. We need to watch out for it because it has, as so many other things, infiltrated the churches. As we've said, Hatred is the quality of being an enemy, being in a state of opposition. It's open hostility towards individuals. It is making someone to be our enemies. And it's natural for our flesh. Our flesh wants to hate those people on the other side. Our flesh wants to hate those people that don't specifically line up with what we think they should. That's our flesh. If we're honest, we'll acknowledge such. And the world is that way. Even the, uh, you know, the people, as I've said before, that spout just love and peace of the world. The, the hippies and liberals especially are some of the most hate-filled people you'd ever see. You're just not talking about the right topic with them <laughs> if you don't see it. But just so, a lot of conservatives, right, can be very hateful too. And we need to be careful with that. And so we covered the topic of loving our enemies. Loving our enemies is Matthew chapter 5 and Romans chapter 12 talks about the fact we're not allowed to seek revenge on others. Right? Turn the other cheek. Don't seek vengeance. People yell and curse at us. Don't yell and curse back at them. In other words, be kind to people. We're not allowed to sue other people, and believers are just as bad about that as the world. We live in a sue-happy society, and we 
as a church, we as believers are not allowed to sue other individuals. There would be one exception to that, and that would be for justice sake. But justice and greed, money are two different things. We're not allowed to sue others. And we're not allowed to hate our enemies. We're not allowed to wish great harm upon them. We're not to rejoice should great harm come upon them. That's our flesh, isn't it? We look and see people that we don't like and bad things happen to them and we say, yeah, they got what they deserve. No, that's not godly. That's not of God. God that does not make God happy. We covered all that. If we see great harm come upon those that would call themselves our enemies, we ought to pray for them. It ought to grieve our hearts. We ought to be kind towards them, right? And then Matthew 5, we're to love our enemies. That simply means just being kind to people. If they're not kind to us, we ought to be kind to them. If they're going to yell at us, we shouldn't yell at them. If they're going to abuse us, we ought to pray for them. Not wish that they die and go to hell. Not wish that terrible things come upon them. Not getting a shouting match with them. Not getting a great debate with them. Not getting a physical altercation. But we ought to be kind and peaceful. You say, that's hard. Yes, it is hard. But God helps us to do these things. And as Matthew 5 says, why we ought to do these things? God's children. To prove that we are God's children. If you turn there quickly in Matthew 5, I'll just read the verse for you because we're practically to where we're going to be today. It says in the very last verse, in verse 48, Matthew 5, Be therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. And that first perfect there means mature. Mature of mind or character. In other words, God's telling us, grow up grow up. You say, well, I don't see a lot, of, a lot of churches acting that way. That's because they're either not saved or they're very immature. And we can't control what churches do, but we can control what we do and how we treat people. Being mature or maturing in the faith. So secondly, under love your enemies, we're on the topic of respecting, obeying, and submitting to authority again in our day in our country, this is not, this is not, I cannot emphasize it enough, not a popular topic because we live in a day of rebellion. In every case, in every case, and people excuse it for various purposes and reasons, and we have no excuse. We need to do what the Bible says to do by faith, Trusting that God is pleased with what we're doing. If you remember, and I'll remind you, Jesus came into a day where a pagan Roman Empire ruled the earth. Remember, there are various temples that were built. There were various pagan rituals performed to these false gods, and there were many of the Romans. Jesus came into this day. Roman Empire ruled the earth, including Israel, was not a democracy, it was a dictatorship. It was an empire where the emperor said what would happen, and that is what would happen. Furthermore, Herod and the Jewish Sanhedrin, neither of which carried much, cared much for God's word, ruled over the Jews. It was a very odd, you might say, arrangement that the Romans had with the Jews, there, there was a lot of different facets to this ruling authority. You had the Roman emperor, which whatever he said went. He, he had supreme authority. He was even seen as a god, much like the Egyptians saw Pharaoh. But then you had King Herod, who was over a region and you had another Herod that was over another region. Remember, you had Galilee, Samaria, Judea, Perea, Decapolis, in that area. And so you'd have at times two or three different men over these different regions with uh, Caesar reigning supreme. But then 
you had the Sanhedrin, which was the priestly ruling class. And somehow they maintained that balance, and sometimes they didn't maintain that balance. It was, it was very odd. And so the Jews are under three distinct ruling authorities, and Jesus came into that. So please remember that when we cover these things. It takes away all our excuses. The scripture reminds us that God places kings and rulers in authority and expects us to respect and obey them. And the Jews, all they wanted to do was cause trouble, <laughs> a good chunk of them. The rest wanted to just live in peace. But you had especially a group called the Zealots that went about, they wanted their nation back, and they went about causing trouble for Rome. And all that did was cause more trouble for everyone else because when Rome saw a troubled state or a rebellious state, they would send the army in even more. So what did Jesus say? And what did Paul, under inspiration of the Spirit of God, and Peter and others say? that we should do with our authority. Now, I know, I know our authority is not just the government, but that's especially, especially what's been addressed in recent days. So we covered, I believe, on Wednesday night, the first thing, which is we must obey the laws that we exist under. Obey the laws that we exist under. And the first under that, that we should not resist those in authority. Remember the law of You've got to carry my military pack for a mile. Jesus says, go the extra mile. Go two miles. Don't have a bad attitude. Have a good attitude. Heap coals of fire upon their heads. Not literally, but figuratively. Do not resist those in authority. And do not give the world an excuse to accuse us. Excuses today to accuse Christians, right? Because of what those Christians are doing. And it doesn't please Christ. We're supposed to live as peaceably as possible with all men. Now, we're living for Christ and the world doesn't like it, but there's plenty of examples where the churches are just causing trouble. Dragging the name of Christ through the mud. It does not please Christ at all because it is not according to his word. So it talks about paying our taxes, something that none of us like to do, but we must do. We ought to live as peaceably as possible with individuals, not cause trouble, riots, rebellion. And we ought to have good testimonies in the community. People should not be able to look at one person in this church and say, this person did me wrong. This person is not a faithful worker. This person tries to cheat individuals. This person has a bad attitude. This person is constantly breaking the law. The world shouldn't be able to say that about us, right? We should have a good testimony in the community. And the worst thing that they could say is they act like Jesus. They have the attitude of Jesus. Don't give the world an excuse to accuse us. So we must obey the laws that we exist under, whether we agree with them or not. You know, we have the privilege to vote. You say, well, what good does that do? Mm, it's better than nothing, I suppose. Um, and whatever laws we have, whether we agree with them or not, we have to keep them. Jesus, he didn't agree with it everything going on in the Roman Empire or in Judea under the Pharisees, but he obeyed the laws. And he's our great example, isn't he? The early church, they obeyed the laws. They followed Christ's example. See, we've had beat into us in America the spirit of rebellion, and that pleases our flesh. We want that more and more but we're to live by faith. And so we're at number two under this, which is respect and submit to the offices of leadership that God has allowed or created. Respect and submit to the offices of leadership that God has allowed 
were created. Look at Proverbs 24, if you would, in verse number 21. I know we look at a lot in the New Testament, but here's a set of verses in the Old Testament on this. Proverbs 24 and verse number 21. The Bible says, My son, fear thou the Lord and the king, and meddle not with them that are given to change, for their calamity shall rise suddenly, and who knoweth the ruin of them both? My son, fear thou the Lord and the king. It's not talking about huddling in fear, terror. It's talking about respect. And our world knows no respect for any in authority today. I see it often, and you probably do too, and it ought to bother us into action with what we can control instead of saying, oh, that's just okay. No, it's not okay. Let's look at a few things under this. One is that Jesus commanded his disciples to obey the scribes and Pharisees. Matthew 23 talks about this. You see, folks, the truth of the matter is this. We either, there's no middle ground with this. We either believe that God has allowed or placed individuals in their given offices for his purposes, or we do not. If we do, then we need to respect those in authority, at least for their office sake. At least for their office sake. And I could focus on all four of these, but that would take way too much time, so we're going to focus on one that includes parents, church leaders, employers, and governments. We need to respect those in authority for their office sake, at least. It includes parents, church leaders, employers, and governments. Parents should be making their children to be respectful and to respect them instead of allowing their children to be abusive towards them. And if you say, oh, my little whatever would never be abusive towards me, then you're living a delusion because all of us want to live abusively towards others. That's our flesh. We just want to live selfishly. We want our way. We want to do what we want. And that's why parents, dads, moms need to get a handle on their households. I know I've got three kids of my own. They have a flesh too, don't you guys? Yeah. I know I've been a child too, and I wanted to fight against my parents. But guess what? My dad made me respect him, and I respect him to this day. I would never speak, at, well, I have spoken against him, and each time I've regretted it. I have dishonored him, and each time I've regretted it. It's for parents to make children respect and honor and obey. It doesn't come naturally. Church, same thing. I'm not going to talk on that because I'm a pastor and I don't feel like I ought to today, but churches, same things. Employers, we ought to have respect for those that are above us. We may not agree with everything they do, and we won't agree with everything they do. By the way, kids, you won't agree with everything your parents do, but guess what? It, they're accountable to God for it. I didn't agree with everything my parents do or did. But it wasn't my job to run the home. Just like in work, it's not our job to run the business. It's our supervisor and manager's job. It's not our job to make trouble. It's our job to say, hey, they've been put in that place of authority. God's allowed them to be in that place of authority, and I'm going to be I've seen it plenty of times when it's been the other way. People didn't respect their supervisors and their bosses. And they pay the consequences. Government's the same way. We think, oh, well, because we live in America, we can just mouth off and we can just do whatever we want and God's okay with that because Constitution. No, God's not okay with it. He's not. Look at what Jesus has to say. I think we'll look at four or five things, four things under this. One is Jesus commanded his disciples to obey the scribes and Pharisees. 
Who were the people that opposed Christ the most? I hope you'd say the scribes and Pharisees, because you'd be right. The people that made themselves to be Jesus' enemy. Look at what he has to say about them in Matthew 23 and verse 1. Then Jesus spake to the multitude and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. Now, what is Moses' seat? Moses' seat is the place of judgment, the seat of judgment, where people could have a trial and they could pass judgment upon Jimmy and say, Jimmy, you owe this fine. Jimmy, you got to go to jail. Jimmy, you're free and clear. Whatever it is, the seat of judgment was Moses' seat. And he says, they sit there. All, therefore, whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do. He could have said, well, they're a bunch of hypocrites. You don't have to listen to them. They're a bunch of unsaved individuals. You don't have to listen to them. Listen to me instead. No, he said, all therefore whatsoever they bid you to observe, that observe and do. Respecting the office of authority, understanding that God allowed those people to be there if he didn't actively put, him, put them there himself. But he does warn them, he says, but do not ye after their works, for they say and do not. Now he stated the truth. He stated they were hypocrites, but they were to obey. They were to listen. There's a difference. And I, I encourage you to note this, jot this down if you don't already know it or maybe you might need it, need it in the future, there is a difference between following after someone and obeying their commands because they're in authority. There is a difference between following after someone and obeying their commands because they are in authority. There's a difference there. When you follow after someone, you're allowing them to influence your life. It's like we have discipleship. Discipleship is a time of influence where we study the Bible, we talk about what God's word has to say. Church is a time of influence where we study the Bible, we see what God's word has to say. There's a difference between following after someone and we as Christians, we claim to follow Christ, right? We follow him in his word. You don't follow me, <laughs> you follow Christ. And it's my job to point every person in this church and under the sound of my voice to follow Christ. All my job is, is to do that by teaching his word. But there's a difference between following after someone, you know, people followed after the Pharisees and the scribes. They thought, oh, they're such wonderful people and they were influenced by their attitude and their actions and what have you. There's a difference between that and just obeying someone's command. Right? Someone says, go do this, go do that. That's obeying a command. It doesn't mean you're following that person, letting them influence your life. Jesus is saying, respect the office. Respect the people that God has put in a place of authority. Secondly, Romans chapter 13. We're not going to read the latter part, but we'll read the first part. Paul commanded the Roman church to obey the government. Now I ask you, where is generally in a corrupt government, which we have one, China has one, Russia has, I don't know of a government that's not corrupt today. Maybe you do, but I, I don't. All the world powers, especially corrupt government, we, we, can, we can agree on that. The Roman Empire was the largest government of its day. It was very corrupt. And if there was ever a center of depravity in Rome, where do you think it was? Rome, right? Just like we'd say, well, if there's ever a center of depravity in America, it would be in Washington, D.C. Yeah, the, the seat of government, the center of government, right? Rome. But Paul, writing to the church at Rome, he reiterated that the church that was in the center of depravity was to respect their God-given authority. To respect their God-given authority. 
Romans chapter 13, verse number one, it says, let every soul be subject. Now, we don't like that word because it requires us to acknowledge that we need to submit. We don't like to submit to authority. That's our flesh. Wives don't like to submit to husbands. Children don't like to submit to their parents. Workers don't like to submit to their bosses. Right? That's our flesh. But it doesn't matter what we as Christians do and do not like to do. It matters that Christ has commanded us to submit when we have certain roles. It's just the truth. Just the truth. People don't like to submit in our day. People say, wear a mask. They don't like to listen, right? People say, don't have so many people in for such and such celebration. People don't like to listen. They like to say, well, I'm going to do whatever I want to do because it makes me feel good. I don't care what the law says. I don't care about other people. I care about me. That's our flesh. And there's no excuse. People say, well, I haven't. X, Y, Z. People say, well, I haven't gone, I haven't traveled for over a year. I haven't seen my family for over a year. I haven't done this for over a year. I haven't gone on a, a field trip. I haven't done the things that I normally do. I haven't been in a restaurant. It doesn't matter. It doesn't make it right. It doesn't make it right. We're to respect God-given authority by faith. By faith. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. Why? Because the Bible says there is no power but of God. Kids, maybe you don't like your parents, but guess what? God gave them to you, just like he gave mine to me. You either believe that or you don't. You say, well, you don't know. I don't need to know. God knows. So you need to say, God gave me my parents, so I'm going to listen to them and submit to them. If mom and dad want me to do this, then I'm going to do it. If they don't want me to do this, I'm not going to do it. If they want me to believe this way, then I'm going to believe this way. If they don't want me to, then I'm not going to because I have faith in God that he'll make it all work out. We either believe it or we don't. There's no power but of God. We stand here today, as it says, the powers that be are ordained of God. We say as Americans, I believe God put or allowed Mr. Biden to be in the White House. You say, how can you say such a thing? Because the Bible says it right there. The Bible says it right there, and the Bible's either right or not. You say, well, well uh, I, I think that Trump was cheated. Well, maybe he was, maybe he wasn't. I don't know, but God does, and he allowed Mr. Biden to be in the White House. Don't you know all the executive orders that he's written? Yeah, every president's done that. That's been put in office. Just do your research. Democrats, Republicans, they're all the time trying to reverse the orders of the other. It's what they do. <laughs> Doesn't mean God hasn't allowed them to be in there. Do you don't know? I don't need to know. God knows. We trust in God. That's why Paul says to the people in the center of depravity in Rome. He says, God gave you your Caesar. Don't you know what Nero did? Yeah. Nero is a wicked man. Other Caesars were wicked men. They did wicked things. God put and or allowed them to be in office and he says, you need to understand this. We call it the sovereignty of God. He's in control. Nothing's out of his control. He says, for whosoever, in verse 2, therefore resisteth the power. Now think about all these rebels, all these rebellious churches today, all these rebellious so-called Christians. 
going about resisting, protesting, doing things that God never told us to do. What are they doing? Oh, they're trying to make our lives better. They're trying to uphold the Constitution. They're trying to, to, to keep our freedom safe. No, it says, whosoever therefore resisteth the power resisteth the ordinance of God. You know, if you look, and it's, it's funny, it, oh, whenever you have bad doctrine, I don't care if it's music or things like this, people always go to the Old Testament where it does not apply to the church. And they say, well, look at what they used to do. It doesn't matter what they used to do. It matters what we have right here. It matters what Christ gave us an example of. It matters what Paul and Peter and James and John and the early church did. <laughs> People don't know how to interpret Scripture properly. Or they don't care because they want to find that one verse or that, that there's a couple of verses that just make their case seemingly for them and give them the excuse to disobey God. I don't care how well-meaning someone is. The Bible says if we resist the power, it says it resisteth the ordinance of God and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation, judgment. People like to say, well, there's two, he two Hebrew women that, that were ordered to cast the babies into the Nile River to be fed to the crocodiles. They, they resisted. And they, no, they, they didn't resist a thing. They just refused. They refused to do wrong. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God. The government says wear a mask. It's not going to hurt you to wear a mask. We should wear a mask. Government says shut down for a time. It's not going to hurt you to shut down for a time. You can still stream. We're not trying to control the, the sermons. We're not trying to keep you from preaching the gospel. We're not trying to keep you. Uh, we, we should do those things. We are to respect the office. We're to obey the authority. This smacks against our flesh. People don't like it. People don't like it. That's why we desperately need revival today, because we have churches living in their flesh. It says, for rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. This is what God's saying, why he's given us certain rulers. Now you say, well, well, Hitler did this, and Nero did that, and Pharaoh did this, and yeah, it doesn't change God's word. It says, wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the saints. For he is the minister of God to thee for good. Say those people that were put in power, ministers of God, that's what the Bible says. God put and or allowed these things to happen for his purposes. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. We either believe it or not. There's no excuse. God takes all our excuses away, doesn't he? He's very good at that. He's very good at that. Look further. Number three under this. Paul taught Timothy and Titus on this subject. Both of these were, as we understand, younger men and Paul's writing these letters to encourage and instruct them on how to act in the church of God, how to act as pastors. Look as he teaches Timothy and Titus on this matter. In 1 Timothy 2 and verse number 1, Paul says, I exhort therefore that first of all, supplications, that's prayer requests, prayers, intercessions, 
and giving of thanks be made for all men. Now who are these men especially? It says for kings and for all that are in authority. Now, I'm as guilty about this as anyone else would be. But we ought to pray and thank God for the people that are in authority over us. Children, you ought to be thanking God for your parents. Doesn't matter how good or how terrible we think that they are, we ought to be thanking God. We ought to be thanking God for those at our work. We ought to be thanking God for those in the government. We do it by faith. And we ought to be praying for these individuals. Why should we do this? It says that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life. Not a boisterous and contentious one, but a quiet and peaceable life. You know, kids, if you just do what your parents ask you to do, just like if I would have grown up, life would be a lot easier, wouldn't it? Just listen to mom and dad. Just treat them with respect. Just you say, well, I, I don't agree with them. It doesn't matter if you're under their house. You're not paying the bills. Right? <laughs> you're not paying for your food. You're not paying for your clothes. You're not paying the electric bill, the water bill, and whatever else bill could be out there. You are being raised by them. You're being cared for by them. You're under their authority. If you don't like it, go live somewhere else. Go pay your own rent for a time. Go pay for your clothes. Pay for your food. That's a major wake-up call, isn't it, adults? Right? Every adult in this room knows what I'm talking about. They just don't want to nod. When you got out on your own, you had to pay your own car, your own car insurance, your own gas, your own car upkeep, and that's just for your car. <laughs> you had to pay for your own clothes. You had to pay for your own food. You had to learn how to cook. You had to learn how to do your own taxes. <laughs> right? You had to learn what rent was, and that rent is a lot. <laughs> true and if you don't believe me and you don't like living under your parents authority there's a road out here called highway 127 it goes up and down north and south and it leads to all manner of places in the world where you can be free from your parents authority <laughs> you say that's harsh no kids that's reality your parents deserve your respect and your obedience. Same with the workplace. You say, my boss is terrible. Go get another job. Well, I don't want to go and, and put in those applications and be the lowest on the totem pole again. Then respect your boss. <laughs> right? It's very simple. People say, I don't like the American government. Fine, move to Canada. Get under the socialized health care and have fun with that. People in Europe, they like to spout off about how great they have it under their socialized health care in Italy and England. And what they don't tell you is your taxes go up quite substantially <laughs> to pay for that socialized health care. And by the way, it's not as great as they make it sound. My father told me that, and he works in the medical field, so I, I, I trust his statistics. He says there's more, more ventilators in Washington County, Maryland, than there are in London, England. <laughs> That's how great that socialized health care is. If you need health care like that, in America, you might have to pay for it, but you'll get it. And by the way, there's laws that if you can't afford it, you generally don't have to pay for much. But over there where it's so much better, in Canada and Europe and other places that isn't America, 
I'm not saying America is so wonderful and great, but people like to think that everywhere else is better. You know, grass is greener on the other side mentality. You know, you get sick and you need care like that, it's too bad. It's too bad. You gotta wait. If you die, oh well, too bad. It's how it is. You say, well, I don't believe that. Do your own research. But don't gripe and complain, cause trouble in America. You don't want to be here, don't be here. <laughs> Simple as that. You say, that's harsh. No, it's reality. I don't want to go through the, the whole citizenship process and, and uh, places like New Zealand, they might not let me in. And I, I don't want to do I, I just Then don't gripe and complain. Respect the authority that God has put over us. It's that simple. It's that simple. Instead of griping, complaining, being rebellious, we ought to be praying for people. And again, I've been there. I know the hatefulness of the IFB movement. I know all about the racial jokes about Mr. Obama. I know all those things. I've heard them too. And I've heard the evangelists, and I've been in the mega churches. I know all of it. I know it's real. And we're not to partake in any of it. We're to be a people that live by faith. It doesn't mean agreeing with every policy. It doesn't mean lining up and supporting abortion. It doesn't mean supporting the feminist agenda or supporting the liberal global warming or whatever they're calling it today movement. It just means looking to Jesus <laughs> and saying, God, you know what's going on. You know what you're doing. Help me to trust you. Help me to do my part. Live a peaceful life in all godliness and honesty. Verse 3 says, For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. You say, what should I pray for my parents? Pray that God would save them if they're not saved. Pray that God would draw them ever closer to himself. What should I pray for my pastor? That God would ever work to draw him closer to himself. What should I pray for my boss? That he would get saved. I, I, I say, don't pray for me to get saved. I know I'm saved. So, I mean, if, if you want to do that, that's up to you. But I know I'm saved. All right? I hope you, know, you can see the fruit in my life. <laughs> but about our boss, pray for their salvation. Pray that we could be a good testimony. Pray that God would draw those people ever closer to themselves. The same with the government. So I don't know what to pray for. Those are some great things to pray for people about. And the more we pray, as it's been said, the more we pray, the less we'll find ourselves complaining because we'll be trusting in Christ. We'll be looking to Jesus. You see, instead of praying for national leaders and submitting to God-given authority, too many churches are encouraged to do the opposite. Right? That's, that's the whole thing with Jerry Falwell's moral majority. Oh, we need the, the politics to get America back to God. America was never a godly nation. We've been religious, but we've never lined up with Scripture. I challenge you to show me where we have, because we haven't. I'm not talking about people saying, I believe in God, because there's plethora of them. I'm talking about following this book. Too many churches are being encouraged to do the opposite of submitting to God-given authority. They're encouraged to rebel, not be obedient. They reveal an attitude of disdain and not respect. They ignore that these are God-given individuals for our country, and we might say for our workplaces, for our families, and believe them to be of man instead. That's what we're saying if we refuse the former, that God's put these people in office, right? Look at Titus chapter 3 and verse number 1. Skip a few pages back to Titus 3. 
Now, Paul is teaching Titus to teach the people at Crete to obey Christ. And he says about these people that Titus is to teach, he says, put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers, to obey magistrates, and be ready to every good work, to speak evil of no man, but to be no brawlers, but gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. Now, what is speaking evil of someone? We must be clear on this because people say, well, evil is just criticizing people. No, speaking evil is slandering people, hating individuals. There's a difference, isn't there? Not speaking the truth in love, not the balance between grace and truth. Speak evil of no man. Be no brawlers, but gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. Paul taught Timothy and Titus very clearly these two things. And fourth, Peter commanded the churches to obey the government. Look in 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse number 13. 1 Peter 2 and verse number 13. Now this is Peter. We have Christ. Then we have Paul, now we have Peter. So we have three different individuals saying the same things. Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake. And again, our flesh does not like to submit. Our flesh likes to control. Our flesh likes to rebel. Likes to tell God, you don't understand. And it says submit. Submit whether it be to the king as supreme or unto governors as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers. You see, the purpose of government, God says, is primarily for justice. For justice. You see that theme throughout Scripture. Are, are the courts perfect? No. Do they always get justice right? No. But that's why it's in existence. Justice uh, we might say defense, right? If people come and attack us, it's what police force is for. Defending us from evildoers. What fire department's for, defending us from fire. Yeah. It's what the army and military's for, defending us from foreign nations. Right? Unto them they are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of them that do well. For so is the will of God. Here's one of the pieces of the general will of God for our lives. This is very clear. This is the will of God. You say, I don't know what the will of God is for my life. Well, we've, we've covered that in Ephesians 5, but here's another piece of that if you're wondering that. It says that with well doing ye may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. Or to have the right attitude about us and the right actions so that people cannot accuse us. Well, there's people that marched into the Capitol building the other week. They could be rightly accused, right? I'm not even saying that the people in Oregon were right when they're not doing what they did, and the people around in Chicago and other places in the country, they're not. But I know the people in Washington, D.C., many of them would dare to call themselves Christians. Well, there, there wasn't a whole lot of well-doing going on. People lost their lives needlessly. No, we're to be peaceable, be submissive, as free it says in verse 16, and not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness. Not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness, but as the servants of God. Honor all men. Love the brotherhood. Talking about the church. Love one another. Right? Fear God. Honor the king. This is not largely promoted today. 
This is largely and conveniently forgotten, but it is the scriptures. It does take work. It takes work to submit to authority. But it's of God. And it's his will. We can't say that it's not. So we see these things that we need to honor, obey, respect authority. Then letter C, or thirdly, under this, we refuse to partake in hostilities. We refuse to partake in hostilities. You look at the Lord Jesus Christ, I told my wife the other day, and Christ more and more adopted the role of what we call a pacifist, except for overturning the tables in the temple. But his example, his message, the local churches uh, being commanded by Peter and John, James, and others, Paul especially, refuse to partake in hostilities. Now, it is one thing, now certain groups have taken this way too far, it's one thing to be part of a military or police force. That's government authority, okay? It's not to say, well, if you're in the military, you're in sin. No, that's government authority or police force or something like that. It's one thing to be part of those things. It's another to work outside of those God-given entities. You know, you, you go out and you set up your own little barbed wire fence sort of thing and call yourself a militia or whatever you want to. Governmental authority is one thing. That's another. God's people are to be those of peace, not violence or rebellion, but we live in a violent world, don't we? We live in a violent country. We live in a day where violence is all around us, just like sexual things, right? All around us, we're inundated with it all. It's like cursing, yeah? It's like inappropriate behavior and attitudes and dress. And we're inundated with it. We're used to it, and it's affected us. Don't say that it hasn't, because it does. We live in a violent world, which is why this concept's so foreign. People try to excuse it and reject it. No, violence, it's in our video games. It's in our music. It's in our TV shows. It's all around us. It's in so many homes, even. You know, kids are allowed to fight each other, and uh, kids are allowed to abuse adults, and adults abuse kids, too. I'm not talking about discipline. I'm talking about real abuse. It's all around us. So what does God want us to do? Two things under this will be done. One, refuse to strive, but be a peacemaker. Refuse to strive. That means refuse to fight. If someone wants to fight you, defuse the situation if you can. Get out of there if at all possible. Look at 1 Timothy 3, and then we'll be in Titus and then in James. But 1 Timothy 3, you say, well, this is talking about pastors. Well, the pastor is supposed to be the example to the church, and the church members are supposed to strive for these things themselves. I, I truly believe it's not just one guy in the church who's supposed to act this way, but it's one guy in the church who's supposed to work to fulfill these requirements, or else he's not qualified anymore. But about the pastor, he says not to be given to wine, meaning a drunkard, right? No striker. You know what striker means? Brawler. Not someone who gets into fights, runs up to Jimmy and says, Jimmy, I don't like you. There's people like that. They think that's okay. You got that short fuse, that temper, and they just go off. Not to be brawlers and strikers. That's what verse 3 says later after not being greedy of filthy lucre or patient. Not a brawler. Emphasizes it twice. We're not to be a person that rushes into a fight. We're not to be a people that love to fight. We're to be a people that get out of the fight. <laughs> be as peaceably as possible. Fighting only reveals more and more of our flesh. Doesn't it? Sure it does. 
Just so, we should not be contentious. Contentious. By the way, in Titus chapter 3 and verse number 1 and 2, Paul tells Titus the same thing about these individuals. Titus uh, 3, 1 and 2. I'm sorry. I think I got the wrong one there. Titus 1 and verse number uh, 7 says, No striker. No striker. It says in Titus 3, 1 and 2, though, that we're supposed to be, yeah, I had the right one, to speak evil of no men in verse 2, but to be no brawlers, but gentle. And then James 4, James rebukes the people he's speaking at, saying you kill. Basically, they strive. I'm going to read it so I can get the right context. It says, from whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence even of your lusts that war in your members? Ye lust and have not, ye kill and desire to have. I don't believe it's talking about literal killing, but destroying your testimony, destroying friendships, right? Ye kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. Ye fight and war, yet ye have not because ye ask not. And just so we're not to be contentious and quarrelsome, which is the second thing. We need to learn to refuse to argue with people. To refuse to argue, to refuse to debate, to just, if people are going to be wrong, let them be wrong. <laughs> if they're not willing to talk about it, especially if there's someone in authority, just, and it's not going to hurt anything, just let them be wrong. It's not worth it. It's not worth fighting. I mean, I see kids arguing with adults, husbands, wives argue back and forth, about these just petty things. And folks, it's the world that's petty. It's not to be us. I'm guilty of it too. We all do it. But we're not to be contentious and quarrelsome, arguing over these things that don't matter. You say, well, it does matter. Well, if someone's not going to listen, they're not going to listen. <laughs> it's not worth the debate. What, you, you want to just uh, be able to walk away and have your chest puffed up and say, well, I showed them. That's just pride. It's just flesh. Some people don't want to be confused with the facts. You could have lived it. You could have done your research on it. You know what you're talking about. If someone's going to be prideful and not listen, then don't waste your time on them. It's not worth it. 2 Timothy chapter 2 tells us this in verse number 14. Of these things, put them, talking about the church members, of these things, put them in remembrance, charging them, talking about the church members, before the Lord that they strive not about words to no profit. Oh, there's people that, I, I show those people on Reddit. I show those people on Facebook. I show those people on Twitter. I show those people over the phone. I show those people at church. Yeah, but what did you destroy in showing those people? Did you destroy your family? Did you destroy your friendship? I yelled at them good, and I mocked them good and called them names, and I showed them how smart I am. That's just flesh. Charge them before the Lord that they strive not about words to no profit. That means a straight, sincere, and serious charging. Saying, Jimmy, you better not do this. You better not drag the name of Jesus through the mud that way. You better not drag the name of Pinecrest Baptist Church through the mud that way. You better not do that and say you're a Christian. I'm not saying that to Jimmy. I'm saying that to us all. But I got to use Jimmy because he's my son and he's right in front of my face. So, Not because he's guilty of that, because he's not. 
They strive not about words to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. Study to show thyself. Now, we all know this verse, but look at the context. Study to show thyself approved unto God. My wife and I have noticed about the same thing at the same time. The Bible never says to read it. It says to study it, to meditate upon it. We ask people, how's your Bible reading? We should be asking, how's your Bible study? Because reading the Bible just to read it doesn't do too much. We have to study to apply it and all of it. We need all 66 books. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. We call that proper hermeneutics, interpreting the scripture correctly. But, 16 says, shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more godliness. They will increase to more godliness. If people just want to argue and debate, especially with these frivolous things, it's not worth it. Refuse to debate. Refuse to argue. You're not going to change someone's mind. God has to. Just like you're not going to save anyone, and neither am I. God has to save them. You say, well, shouldn't I give them truth? Yeah, there's rules for that. There's rules for that, which we're going to look at. But we're not to fight with people. It says in their word, you keep fighting with these toxic individuals, we call them. You keep yourselves gathered around these unbelievers. They're your friends and, and even your best friends. And all they do is want to argue the Bible. All they want to do is live ungodly. Look at what's going to happen. We continue down this path in our lives. It says their word will eat as doth a canker. Talking about canker sore. You ever have a sore? Something that... This is on your flesh, or maybe, maybe you have an abscess in your gums. Ever have that? That's not fun. It's painful, I understand. You just want it to go away. But let's talk about one that just eats away at you. I know preachers that surround themselves with unbelievers, and they're under that false doctrine, that bad attitude all the time. What do you think is going to be the end of that eventually? They're going to fall into error because they're living in error. You say, well, maybe those people will get saved. If they're not interested in the gospel, you've already given it to them. God says, they know the truth. <laughs> Being around those type of people will just eat away and eat away and eat away. And look. It ate away at two people specifically that Paul mentions, of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus, who concerning the truth, look what happened to these, have erred. Apparently, Hymenaeus and Philetus were doctrinally sound and they got subverted. Do you know how many that's belonged to or that's happened to? I know Baptists that have become Jehovah's Witnesses. Not personally, but I know the stories. They're subverted. I know pastors that have quit and become Protestants that said they were Baptists. They were subverted. If, if these people were ever saved at all. Concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already. And overthrow the faith of... You see, it's a domino effect. You don't just influence yourself. <laughs> we all have our circle of influence. Oh, we want to say, well, I'm just, I'll just live how I want and no one will be affected by it. No, everyone that you're around is affected by it. None of us live to ourselves. We would like to, but that's not reality. These, they've already overthrown, Paul says, the faith of some. The faith of some. It says, nevertheless, 
the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his, and let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, some to honor, some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, and meet for the master. He's talking about sanctification. If we say we're saved, we need to be disciples of Christ. As disciples of Christ, we're constantly seeking to be more like him. Meet for the master's use. Talking about being suitable and prepared unto every good work. So Paul tells Timothy, flee also youthful lusts and follow righteousness, which is a life according to God's word. Faith, looking unto Jesus, right? Trusting in his word. Charity, godly love, love defined by God's word. Peace, follow these things, he says, with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Who should we gather ourselves to? People that love God and his word, right? Not people that could care less. Not people that could care less. It says, but foolish and unlearned questions avoid, knowing that they do gender strifes. And the servant of the Lord. Now, people say this, talking about pastors, and it is, but it's also talking about the church members, too. Remember the context? The servant of the Lord must not strive. If what we're known for is being a jerk to people, that's not godly. If what we're known for is we can put on a good debate, that's not godly. If what we're known for is fighting and contending with individuals and loving such things, it's not godly. The servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. If God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him and his will. It's not saying never speak the truth. We are to speak the truth. We're to do so with the right attitude. You say, how do I know I have the right attitude? When you refuse to argue with people, when you don't name call, when you don't mock and put yourself up as some great thing, you know, we know our flesh. We're to be humble. We are to earnestly contend for the faith. That simply means standing for the truth. If people will not hear, we're to have the attitude to ourselves, not saying this to others because they'll just get upset, but the attitude of, they, well, they know the truth <laughs> and pray that God would help them to see it. That's not the attitude of the world, is it? People want to fight. They want to argue. They want to force their opinion, their thoughts, their way of life upon yours. And our flesh, we want to do the same to them. But that's not God's will. See, we understand with salvation... We're not to persecute people, try to make them be saved. You can't make someone be saved. God has to give them that desire. God has to give them that faith and that understanding. We simply have to do our part. We shouldn't argue with people. We should separate, be peaceable. Matthew 5, 9 says, be peacemakers. You know, the, the world is not going to stop the argument. We have to. We have to. We're the ones with the Holy Spirit living within us, are we not? We're the ones who are responsible for stopping the argument and saying, yeah, I'm not going to argue. I'm not going to fight with you. Let's just move on to another subject. And if people will not do that, then still refuse to argue. <laughs> I'm not going to do it. People will try to go, Jimmy, what do you think about this? And if you know it's just going to be an argument, Jimmy will say, well, 
I, I, you know what I think on it. I'm not going to argue about it. But what do you think about it? I'm not going to argue about it. Oh, there's nothing wrong with a good debate. There, there is. I'm not going to argue about it. Oh, don't you, don't you love our friendship? Don't you love being a Christian? Or whatever people want to goad. I'm not going to argue about it. Be a peacemaker. That's what pleases Christ. Titus chapter 3 and verse number 8. Titus chapter 3 and verse number 8. Gives us the rules for discussion with individuals. Okay? I hope you'll remember this because this has greatly helped me. I used to be one of those, and my flesh still does love to debate with people. But I've had to learn what God's word has to say. And Paul says, this is a faithful saying. And these things I will that thou affirm constantly, repeatedly. <laughs> and we need this, don't we? That they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable, profitable unto men. Verse 9, but avoid foolish questions and genealogies and contentions and strivings about the law, for they are unprofitable and vain or empty. It's not worth it to argue with that family member that just won't listen. It's not profitable to argue with that friend that just won't listen. In my case, that missionary or that pastor that just doesn't care. You have it. And you have it all the time, it seems. It's unprofitable and vain. A man that is a heretic after the first and second admonition rejects. So you're to state your peace, state the truth. If they reply, state it again. If they won't listen, okay, have a good day. After the first and second admonition, reject. Separate from them. Don't continue the debate. Don't continue the conversation. If they have not a teachable heart, if they have not a desire to follow Christ, you can see that. Separate from them. Say, well, they're my best friend. Doesn't matter. Separate from them. Oh, they're in my family. I can't separate from them. Then refuse to talk about it. <laughs> they want to talk about it? Say, no, thank you. In so many words. Knowing that he that is such is subverted. Subverted. That word subverted means turned inside out. You say, well, I know someone they used to, it, it seemed follow sound doctrine. Now they're following that. What happened to them? They've been subverted. Maybe they always were. I don't know. Turned inside out. And sinneth being condemned of himself. God knows what he's doing. He knows what he's talking about. And if we do lose friends, he's able to replace them. We cannot give excuses for our sin, for encouraging the sin of others. We have to trust in God's word. Refusing to argue and fight with people may yet offend them, but it pleases our Father in heaven. If someone gets mad at you because you refuse to fight with them, that's on them and that's their problem. <laughs> our flesh wants to fight, but the Spirit desires peace. And lastly, and quickly, refuse not only to strive, but be a peacemaker, but refuse to cast pearls before swine, but invest them in faithful men. Refuse to cast pearls before swine, but invest them in faithful men. And this is a clear teaching of Christ. This is actually in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 7 and verse number 6. And this is, this is not me being vulgar. This is Christ and his words. His words. He says in verse 6, Give not that which is holy unto the dogs. Talking about an impudent individual, a person that 
is not interested in truth. Give not that which is holy unto the dogs. You say, well, am, am I not supposed to preach the gospel? Yes, but if they don't want it, don't waste time trying to convince individuals when they don't want to be convinced. Don't try to make people be saved. Don't try to make people follow Christ. Now, there's certain exceptions to that. You know, you know parents have to rule the house and lead the house and say we are going to do certain things and we are not going to do certain things. Parents have to do that. People in authority have to do that. But when it comes down to us as individuals, I can't make Jimmy be saved. Jimmy's got to be saved because he wants to be saved. But I can make Jimmy act a certain way and I can make Jimmy stay off certain things on the internet and I can control who he's around and things like that. And I ought to as his father. As far as being saved, as far as following Christ, choosing to be his disciple, give not that which is holy unto the dogs, neither cast ye your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn again and rend you. That means tear you up. How many churches have been torn up because they have declared people to be saved and put those individuals in places of leadership and those people either never were saved or, and or interested in following Christ and they end up splitting the church, causing a mass exodus or any number of other things, in some cases abusing children, right? How many churches have been rended? How many friendships have been rended? How many relationships have been rended? Because people would not just say, okay, I see you're not interested. We're not going to fight over this. We're not going to argue. God's got to work. And so the Bible says, we're not to waste time with fools and scorners. What is a fool? A fool is someone that rejects God's word. What is a scorner? Someone that rejects God's word and seeks to recruit others to their foolish calls. Psalm, or not Psalm, but Proverbs 9 talks about this, and multiple Proverbs do. But Proverbs 9 and verse number 7 says, He that reproveth a scorner getteth to himself shame. He that rebuketh a wicked man getteth himself a blot. Reprove not a scorner lest he hate thee, rebuke a wise man, and he will love thee. You see, if you reprove, you see the two differences between reproving and rebuking, too. Rebuking is absolutely just tearing into someone, and there is a time for rebuke. Reproving is, is a simple reproof, a simple instruction, and the scorner can't even handle that. If you say it with a calm tone, with the right attitude, it doesn't matter to a scorner. They hate God's word. But someone that's wise and loves God's word, you can rebuke them. You can actually tear into them, and they will see where they're wrong. And they, because they love God's word, they'll be like, okay. <laughs> rebuke a wise man, he'll love thee. You say, why would I ever love anyone that rebuked me? Because in this case, in such a way, someone rebukes a wise individual. They understand that that individual is just trying to get them to get away from sin and turn to Christ. That's the greatest love, isn't it? The greatest love. When you tell someone that they're wrong, how to get it right, because you don't want their life to be destroyed. The wise person understands that. We, we've gotten so far from that, though, haven't we? We've gotten so far. Proverbs 23 and verse number 9, just another one on this. It says, Speak not in the ears of a fool, for he will despise the wisdom of thy words. If you want to be despised, keep talking to fools. Keep trying to convince them to live spiritually. They won't do it because they don't love God's word. We're not to keep coming at, you know, as an IFB preacher, I, I learned, and I, I paid the price for this, I learned 
for what we call follow-up, which ended up basically being stalking people and that weren't interested in the Bible. You, someone gets saved, they make a profession of faith, they pray a prayer, but they don't come to church. So you go back, hey, we missed you Sunday. Ah, blah, blah, excuse. They don't want to go to church. So you keep going back and going back and going back. And they, they keep giving you the same excuse. We're not supposed to do that. If they're not interested, they're not interested. They prayed a prayer just to pray a prayer. God didn't change their heart. If they are interested, guess what they'll do? They'll come to church. <laughs> they'll follow Christ. But see, we like to excuse, we don't want to say that our methods are wrong when they are. When they are. You know, the same thing, visitors come, we, we'd have them fill out a visitor card so we could call them, so we could email them, so we could go visit them and you know, I, I get some of that, but a lot of it is, hey, won't you come back? Won't you come back? Won't you go? You know what? If people want to come back, they'll come back. <laughs> That's all there is to it. Don't cast your pearls before swine. People aren't interested. Don't try to make them be interested. You know, that's another sin of the churches today. They're trying to make people be interested. If people don't want Christ, a gift card is not going to make them want Christ. A carnival is not going to make them want Christ. A loaf of bread is not going to make them want Christ. Any number of things, any number of entertainment we can provide, any number of promotions we can have, isn't going to make them want Christ. They have to want him for themselves. I don't see in the Bible that any number of things can generate a desire for Christ. It's God that does that. We ought to be praying as we pray for people, pray that God would give them that desire. So who are we to invest in? 2 Timothy 2, verse 1 and 2 says faithful men. We'd say faithful individuals, people that hunger and thirst for righteousness, people that want to follow Christ. And that's rather the attitude that we have here. If people want to follow Christ, we have all the time in the world. There's all the grace in the world, all the patience in the world. And that's what the Bible promotes. But if people don't want to follow Christ, then we don't waste our time. It's a choice, right? It's a choice. Don't cast your pearls before swine. Invest in faithful men. Spurgeon says this, and we'll close. The good man has his enemies. He would not be like his Lord if he had not. If we were without enemies, we might fear that we were not the friends of God. For the friendship of the world is enmity to God. Father, I pray that you would help us today. Whatever decision that we need to make, whatever change in our lives, we pray you'd help us to make it. We pray for our president and those in leadership that you would work on their hearts, that they would be saved, that you draw them close to you. We pray for all those in authority that you would work, the bosses, the pastors, the parents, Pray you would help and work. Help us to submit where we need to submit. Help us to determine to be peacemakers, to not get the last word in, to not cast pearls before swine, as it were, to love those that love you, to have profitable conversations and good attitudes. Help us, we pray. And Father, if there be any that are not saved, we pray that they would be, that they would choose Christ and follow him. And we'll thank you, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. With heads bowed and eyes closed, my wife's going to come and play. Maybe God spoke to your heart about something. Maybe it's your temptation to get into those debates, to get into those fights. Maybe it's your temptation to 
want to do what the rest of the world is doing and to rebel against authority. Maybe it's your temptation to do these things. It, it is our temptation of our flesh. Many of us, if not all of us, maybe we just need to say to the Lord afresh and anew, help me, God. Help me. If you work in the world, you have authority. Help me to be submissive to my boss and my supervisors. You, you're a child and you're under your parents' authority. Help me to be submissive to my parents. Help me not to argue and fight. Help me to be submissive and obedient. Uh, whatever it is, how, every one of us as Americans, help us to be submissive to what the government does. Whatever it is, I don't know what's coming across the path for America. People have been crying doom and losing our rights for years. It's not about all that. It's about following Jesus, being a good testimony, trusting in God and his word and what it says is true and what it has put forth today is certainly true. We all need to determine to not be worried about what's going to happen, what is happening, but to just trust in Christ. With our heads bowed and eyes closed, let's stand together. My wife's going to play. Whatever decision you have to make, I encourage you to make it. And we'll, we'll uh, take as much time as we need. Sarah's going to play. Father, we thank you for this time. Thank you for the folks that came out this morning and just pray that you would help us. We live in a troubled world, a corrupt society. We live in a place where the world and the devil is trying to reach out to us and subvert us constantly and our flesh likes that. I just pray you'd help us. Help us. We so desperately need your help. Well, thank you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Turn to 409, if you would, please. I know whom I have believed. 409, we'll sing 
at least the first verse. And I trust this is your statement today. I know whom I have believed. Verse four, number four and nine, verse one. I know not why God's wondrous grace to me hath made known, nor why unworthy Christ in love redeemed me for his own. But I know whom I have believed, and am persuaded that he is able to keep the which I've committed unto him against that day. Verse 2, I know not how this saving faith to me he did impart, nor how believing in his word wrought peace within my heart. But I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against the day. Well, God bless you for being here this morning. We trust that God spoke to your heart in a certain way. That'll be a help to you. My wife and I can be of help throughout the week. Please let us know. If you have discipleship this week, we'll be having that, and we look forward to seeing you on Wednesday, 7 o'clock, Lord willing. So please be praying for one another and encouraging one another, and we look forward to seeing you Wednesday. God bless you.